The title of today's message is White Flag. So if you look up the meaning of a white flag, and uh, so happens I made this out of a white trash bag. White flag means surrender or truce. A truce means a suspension of hostilities for a specific period of time by mutual agreement of the warring parties, a ceasefire, an armistice. So a lot of emotion, a lot of war, a lot of fighting, a lot of protesting, a lot of sadness, um, a lot of sharing. I'm not a big fan of social media. We use it to try to reach people. But people used to run their mouths, now they run their thumbs. And something gets sent to you and you say, wow, I think this is cool, and you share it. You have no idea if it's true. You're just on a roll, feeling things, thinking things. And I'm asking for a ceasefire. Waving the white flag to say, can we stop and think about what we're doing to each other and what we're doing to our country? Um... It is almost impossible, if you live in this country and care at all about the country, to not be sad. Um, I have been very sad. There's no way that you can see a picture, a video, of any man, much less a white man, with his knee for that long on any man's neck, much less a defenseless black man, George Floyd. I can't watch it anymore. Um... You say, well, is that for racial reasons? No, just for human reasons, right? Um, Let me talk a little bit about George Floyd. Um, He, I believe, there's a chance, I I don't know the man, I didn't know the man, but from what I can tell in my research, uh, there's a good chance George was a Christian. And you say, well, and let me read you notes from his autopsy. In his, in his autopsy were found fentanyl, methamphetamine, and THC, the ingredients that produce marijuana high. Fentanyl is a potent synthetic opioid with heroin-like effects. People who use it regularly or chronically develop tolerance to it. Um, the amount that he had in him could kill most people, but if you've used it, it, it doesn't. Methamphetamine is a stimulant used called speed was found at a low level. You say, oh, well, you're about to bash George Floyd. Now I'm about to ask you, if you died right now, what would be in your system? Physically, spiritually, what's in your heart? What's in your mind? What would you stand before God and deal with? You say, well, how can this, how can this black criminal, if you go read his, his rap sheet, it's, it's unbelievable. All kind of issues. Well, I thought we served a Jesus that could save people like that. And that if he can save people like that, just like me, they can follow Christ, make a huge difference in the world, and then struggle. And they may die struggling, passing $20 counterfeit bills with a system full of of drugs. Still didn't deserve to die the way he died. Um, I understand this is not where everybody is, but somewhere I also, and I don't know how we get there as a, as a, as a whole, but I also feel bad for Captain David Dorn's family. You say, well, it's not time to feel bad for him. When is it time? Retired police captain watching a pawn shop for a friend. Some looters came in and he got killed. Well, we don't care about him. Now listen very closely. I do not want to be misquoted. I understand that the picture of a white cop with his knee on a black person's neck is what the, 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 the community in a lot of ways feels has been going on for 400 years. I get that. And that we want that to stop. I do not have the power to stop that. 
All I can do is find a mirror in a closet and look in that mirror and say, Lord, what responsibility do I have here? Now, I'm going to share some things that I'm not really proud of. One day, my dad produced legal size, bigger than legal size documents, copies of some ancestor. Where he found this and why he had it, I have no idea. And I probably still have the copies. And I found out that day that one of my great, great, whatever grandfathers owned a thousand slaves. A thousand slaves. And I read his will and certain slaves he left by name to certain people because he cared about them. And they said, well, you, you should feel terrible. Now, you explain to me why I should feel terrible about somebody I don't even know. Well, that's, that's, that's what's on you. So all the black looters that I watched on TV for day after day after day, mostly black looters stealing things out of stores. So I suppose all black people are thieves now. I don't think that. And hopefully you don't think that. Because if you think that, now we got a real problem. Do I have any control whatsoever about what my ancestors did? Now, if I perpetuate that nonsense, now we got a real problem. Now, you say, well, I live in a culture where this is being perpetuated. Then do something about it. You say, well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean burn the mother down. That doesn't mean that. And I'm going to read you some verses you are not going to be happy with that were written to people who lived under Roman rule, the same people that strung Jesus up on a cross. You want some police military brutality? I'll show you some in the gospel. You say, well, how do you change this? I have a close friend named Darren. I met him on a mission trip in the Amazon, came back, someone took Darren, he lived out in the suburbs in Frisco, white guy, a friend of my brother's and a friend of my brother's, uh, a friend of his, and this guy, Darren, his wife had died, got very sick and died, had two little boys, and, and he got pulled into drugs and was a mess, and, and God saved him and turned him around, and he moved to Frisco, our families would vacation together, my three girls, his two boys, we'd go on a trip or something together, and one day somebody takes Darren to a part of Dallas called Bonton. Four miles from downtown, a food desert basically. And Darren goes down there and God touches his heart. And Darren buys a house in Bonton. And they thought he was law enforcement that had lost his mind, who's going to buy a house in Bonton, a white dude, you know, you've lost your mind. And he moves into Bonton because God told him to move to Bonton because you can't change it from out here somewhere. His neighbor is a guy named Darius. And Darius um, is very sick. And so he meets Darius and is concerned about Darius and his condition. He's on dialysis, needs a kidney. Now, I'm abbreviating a very long story. You, you Google Bonton, you want to see where God's doing something that can't be done, Bonton. My brother goes down there every week. He lives out north, but he's down there every week, and that is his family. And they don't care what color you are down there. They are a family. And the other day, Darius needed a, a mattress. And some woman who didn't even know him had a mattress to donate. And Darius, you know, so I need a mattress. They delivered it and somehow found out that he needed a kidney. And the woman who didn't even know Darius, hadn't met him, asked what the blood type was. And this white stranger, who was just going to donate a bed, found out she was a match for Darius, and said, I'll give him a kidney. Now, you can talk about Black Lives Matter all you want, and they do. But that's putting feet to the deal. You say, well, I don't think I'd give my, if you're white, you say, I don't know if I'd give a kidney to a white person. If you're black, would you give your kidney to a black person? Would you, would you even think about giving your kidney to a white person? 
See, nobody wants to go down inside the heart. We want to change everything out here around us. We don't want to get to the heart stuff, because if the heart changes, then you got real change. Let's burn something. That's a whole lot easier than saying, Lord, is it me? Now, I personally have been at something with this bunch of people, some come and go, for a long time. And the number one thing that we have in common is a person. And his sweet name is Jesus. And we may not agree on everything politically. But we are a family. And why in the world God would adopt all these crazy kids and make us sit at the same table together, I have no idea. Because we all bring our baggage, we all bring our junk. And what about this and what about that? You need to make a sprint run for the cross, grab it, hold on to it for dear life, because it's all we've got. I have been trying to do something. I went this week to one of the protests to stand with the people that were protesting what happened to George Floyd. I told Rebecca I was going down there. She said, be, be careful. Why? Because you bad, you can get hurt. Because there's all kind of people doing all kind of things. So I go to this protest to stand about him. And one of the most well-known black preachers in Dallas, Texas, gets up and goes off on everything but Jesus. Had a shot at a crowd of kids, a bunch of people listening. And it was about everything but Jesus. So that's very frustrating to me. Now, again, listen very closely. If all you want is to be equal, but you don't want to be a family, I'm not interested in that. You want equality without community, I'm not interested in that. You say, well, there's a lot of people that are. I'm not one of those people, or I'd be out there doing what they're doing. And you say, well, what about all the white churches, how this is all perpetuated? Why don't you visit a white church? You say, well, they don't want me there. They say everybody's welcome. Well, I don't want to be rejected. Then you don't want it to change. And, I, and I've, been, I've been quietly, we're down here just doing what we do and put it out there. We've had tens of thousands of people come through these doors in the last 20 years. And I hear stuff like this. Oh, that's a very interesting new paradigm you have there. I'm like, let me tell you something. This ain't no new paradigm. What you got going on out there, that's the new paradigm. Homogeneous. Whatever. Well, we just feel more comfortable together. Now, I've had black people tell me this. Well, you know, we, we got to be with those white folk all week long. We don't want to do church with them. And you say, well, I'm white, and I'm going to visit a, a, a black church. It just goes so long. They don't even break for lunch. They're out of control. The Holy Spirit takes over. Things happen that you can't, you can't explain. They do cultural things that we, we just, we, you know, we don't know what that is. I learned something when I got married. And then God dropped three beautiful women in my house. As a husband, you better know how to shut up and listen or you're not going to make it. Right? And I still, only God himself can answer this one. Women either just want you to listen or they want you to listen and fix it. But nobody knows which it is when it is. So if that's true about relationships, uh, where's Tony? She's over here. Tony's mom is right there. Single mom? Yes. Raise a daughter. About Dr. Tony Harrison Kelly, your daughter. Right. right? Proud mama. Black mom, raised her daughter, became a PhD. If I want to know what Tony's mama feels, you know what I need to do? I need to sit down with Tony's mama. 
And I had to ask her, what's going on? How do you feel? Well, what if I don't agree with what she feels? That's not the point. I just need to shut up and listen. Now, my Bible talks about weeping with those that weep and rejoicing with those that rejoice. What if someone weeps and what they're weeping over, you don't really understand, but you end up weeping with them because you love them? You're not sitting there, you don't have to sit there and say, oh, I understand what you're going through. That's not what they're looking for. They want somebody to listen. Now, I do, Patrick will tell you, you know, people tell you, I, I, sit, I listen. I, I sometimes get defensive, come back. That's human nature, but I'm trying hard to listen. And I listen, I say, okay, I hear what you're saying. I get, uh, you're really not going to like this. So if anybody wants to leave now, you just shut it off, just shut it off because you're not going to like this. People ask me, is there such, is there racial profiling? Absolutely there's such a thing as that. You can't act like that's not happening. Then they'll say, is there, you know, there's genocide of black people, black men. Now, the answer to that question is yes and no. And you're not going to like any of this, but that's okay. In 2019, 15 unarmed black men were killed in this country. That is not genocide. But I'll tell you what is genocide. I'm going to read you a quote. There are those who argue that the right to privacy, and I'm going to tell you who this is before I read it. This is Jesse Jackson on abortion in 1977. There are those who argue that the right to privacy is of higher order than the right to life. That was the premise of slavery. You could not protest the existence or treatment of slaves on the plantation because that was private and therefore outside your right to be concerned. In the abortion debate, one of the crucial questions is when does life begin? Anything growing is living. Therefore, human life begins when the sperm and egg join and the pulsation of life takes place. From that point, life may be described differently as an egg, embryo, fetus, baby, child, teenager, adult, but the essence is the same. What happens to the mind of a person and the moral fabric of a nation that accepts the aborting of the life of a baby without a pang of conscience? What kind of a person and what kind of society will we have 20 years hence if life can be taken so casually? It is that question, the question of our attitude, our value system, our mindset with regard to the nature and worth of life itself that is the central question confronting mankind. Failure to answer that question affirmatively may leave us with a hell right here on earth. That's 1977 Jesse Jackson. What happened to that? The same thing that's happened to everything else we had. You say, well, it's a white Bible. My Bible is not white. My Bible is a Bible. You say, well, people have used it for all kind of foolishness and justified all kind of behavior. And so do we. And yet the things that it tells us, the truths that it lays out, that marriage is between a man and a woman. Oh, that's gone. Why? Because a bunch of people decided we, won't, we don't want that anymore. So we just pull that out of the Bible. Aren't you afraid to say that? I'm not afraid. I'm afraid of him. Amen. Now there's not male and female. You say, well, people have challenges. I'll tell you how to overcome your challenges. Get you some Jesus. You say it's not that easy. It is that simple. No-brainer things. Just insipidly pulled away. Basic things. Marriage. Law and order. And you, you say, oh, but law and order. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you're going to wish you hadn't tuned in or listened, if, you, if you're still listening. You say, well, I'm going to go somewhere where they're more tolerant. And, and you know what you're going to end up with? Nothing. You know what? Let's, uh, let's read a verse. Jeremiah 17, 9.
Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and who can know it? Now, this is the hard thing about getting one of the parties in the relationship to listen. There are a lot of people, and I'll just throw a blanket deal out there, in some cases white people, who, why would we change anything? There's nothing wrong. And we, I love God. I serve God. Um, yeah, I, I, I met a black guy. I waved at one in the store. I'm kind to black folk. Let me, let me tell you how you know you're in a relationship with a person. Sooner or later, you're going to be eating with them. You have a meal together. It's a family. A family gathers. So, you say, well, I want change. Let me, let me tell you the only way you're going to get the change you really want. You can get some temporary change. And there are people out there who will hijack all your emotion for temporary change. Because it, with temporary change, they get everybody, they wait. Do you realize there are people in this country that just sit waiting with their bricks and, and matches waiting. And when something like this blows up, here they come. And it appears that it's a bunch of white kids. It's not black people. And they hijack the, 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 the legitimate protest and burn the place down. And now everybody gets upset. Why? Because God, the devil doesn't want us together. He wants us apart. So, you better get you a white trash bag flag and wave it and sit down with some people and have some conversations or there's not going to be anything left. Now let's read Genesis 50. And before I read you Genesis 50, um, I'm going to give you some background. I cannot wait to meet, the, to meet this kid, Joseph. And I come back to him a lot. This is a kid. He's the youngest in a family. He's having dreams as a kid about God doing something with his life. He tells his brothers. His brothers hate him. They hate him so much. Now, now track with me. His brothers hate him so much that when he goes out to check on them watching the flocks, they're going to kill him. One of the, the brothers says, no, we can't kill him. Throw him in a pit and let's figure out what we're going to do. Slave traders come by. Slave traders. And they sell him, their own brother, to slave traders. They take him to Egypt. He's sold on the block to a man named Potiphar. He works in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife is attracted to this young man and chases him around all the time trying to seduce him and he won't do it. And finally one day she accuses him of, you know, rape. He tried to do something to me. I think, I think Potiphar knew who he was married to because Joseph was not executed. He was put in the king's prison. So now he's gone from running a house to running a prison. He ends up running that prison and ends up interacting with some of the king's servants. And, in, and ends up interpreting some dreams. And what happens in Joseph's case? He goes from being a slave, owned by a man, put in prison, runs the prison, then ends up in a matter of hours from the, from the prison because he interpreted a dream, he ends up in front of Pharaoh and is the prime minister of Egypt at 30 years of age. Now, you're, not, you're really not going to like this. I have read it, and I've read it, and I've read it. There ain't one whining verse in the whole story. There's not one breath of complaint. Why, why, why? God, what are you doing? It's a kid who knows who he is, whose he is, and that no matter what happens, he's going to trust this God. And by 30, he is so far up on his feet, he can literally save Egypt, and it turns out his own family.
Now read, read Genesis 50 down to verse 14. And after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers and all who went up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespasses of your brothers and their sin for they did evil to you. You would be completely justified in whatever you did to them because they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespasses of the servants of, of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am I in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about it as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Here's how this stuff rattles the world. The church where everybody got killed. Anybody remember where that was? Black church. Just making sure we're listening. Guy comes in, shoots them all. And what do they do? What is their reaction, their response to people being killed? Anybody? Forgave them. What the? Forgive them? Are you people nuts? We want revenge. The power of forgiveness turns out to be way more powerful than revenge. Because people don't know what to do about it. And ultimately, it's the only answer. Peter has a sword when Jesus is arrested. I, I think he, was swing, he wasn't swinging for the ear, but he clipped the guy's ear off. Jesus heals and says, look, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. You say, well, we've lived by the sword in this country, so we're willing to die by the sword. And then it just is going to fold in on you. What goes around comes around is that, that phrase of you live by the sword, you die by the sword. How about something different for a change? You say, but if we do what Jesus says, it seems like we do nothing. Now, here's what I told my girls. You say, easy for you, white privilege, you got white girls. You know, I didn't have enough money to, to write a check and put my kids on their rowing team in some big Ivy League school. So where's all my white privilege? And by the way, that's what some of the looters in California were saying. Well, they, they do what they want to do. Then, you know, it's just not fair. We're going to take a, whatever we're taking. So all this injustice doesn't make any sense, but it doesn't mean you have to lose your mind in the midst of it. You still have a brain. You have feelings. Your sadness. I get all that. But you can think. You can ask God for wisdom and navigate through this. And instead of just retweeting and, and TikToking your brains out out there trying to get people to like you, why don't you, why don't you tweet some Jesus answers? Take a social stand. How about taking a spiritual stand? Where when, when, if we, when if we just put all your stuff up here on the screen, we find out, well, you know what? They, they feel strongly about some things, but it seems like it's all about Jesus. Not about picking a side. Um, so, Tony, still back there? Tony's mama. You know what? I don't know what you told your little girl growing up, but I doubt that you sat her down and looked at her and said, you will never amount to anything because you are black. Did you tell her that? There's no chance for you in this world because you are black. You can't be educated. You can't achieve anything because you're black. I can't imagine you telling her that. Right? Nobody tells their kids stuff like that. Or if they do, I don't care what color you are, you've lost your mind. I told my girls, 
you can be whatever God wants you to be. And that's a fact. You say, well, I was born in the hood and come up with whatever your excuse is and there's no opportunity. Let me tell you something. My God is not limited by your hood. And you say, well, how's it going to happen? I don't know. How did it happen to Joseph? He trusted God. And God protected him and provided for him. And he stayed on a track. And all of a sudden, just like that, the book says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And in due time, he'll lift you up. If you lift you up, he'll put you down. If you, if you, if you humble yourself, he'll pick you up. Well, I want more. It's not fair. How about asking God what more looks like and being just fine with that? Well, it's not fair. They, they have that. Now it's just, it's just jealousy. Now it's just avarice. Now it's just envy. You know, I, I don't remember a meeting where floating around somewhere in the cosmos, somebody approached me and said, hey, you're about to be born. Okay, pick what you want. We can put you in a white family. You can be Taiwanese, man. It's a, there's a lot of good stuff going on in Western China. What you want to be? Nobody asked me what I wanted to be. Nobody asked me what family I wanted to be born into. Nobody asked me what color I was going to be. This is what I got. I tanned it every once in a while trying to be black, but it's a, that's what I got. Okay, so, so now you don't like me because this is what I got born into. Yeah, but your people. You know what? Don't be lumping me in a bunch of your people stuff because you don't like that either. Your people. Enough of your people. My people are his people. That's who my people are. And we wonder why the world wants nothing to do with Jesus. Now, let me tell you something. If the church can't demonstrate what God said could be done, it's over. Because you can pass all the laws, you can change every policy you want to change. It is not going to change. Just new people are going to take over. And they're going to promise you power. You are not going to have any power. Unless hearts change, there's still evil in the world. And there are people that don't have your best interest in heart, even if they tell you they do, to make you feel better and get you to do things that you don't want to do. Matthew chapter 5. I got a few more minutes. People that are watching the clock go, we won't have to take it much longer because he's running out of time. Matthew chapter 5. Now, this is, this is going to blow your mind. It still blows my mind. Let's go down for the sake of time to verse 11. Uh, verse 10. Verse 9. 8. I'll go 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I don't like people saying bad things about me. I get emails. You, you should read my emails. <laughs> You'd think I'd quit. Go down to verse 38. You have heard that it's said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. What in the world? You say, well, Martin Luther King, he, he tried the peaceful approach. That didn't work. Well, then let's burn it down and see if it works. I tell you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Go with him two. 
Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's no brainer. Well, that sounds like a, a, a duh. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be <coughs> sons of your Father in heaven for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what are you more than, than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. If you hate white people, the problem is with you. If you hate black people, the problem is with you. It's not what they're doing. You can't control that. What changes the world is when a black person walks into an environment and has a relationship with a living God, and no matter what that person says to them or how they mistreat them, they don't lose their joy. You cannot have my joy. You cannot have my peace. It's too expensive. And what you say or think about me does not determine whether I matter or not. I matter because he says I matter. And I don't care what color you are, that applies. I don't need the culture to tell me I matter. I didn't think I mattered no matter what anybody said, and I found out God said I mattered. Holy, blameless, chosen, adopted, boom, 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 Ephesians 1. Get you some of that. Well, but they're being mean. They're per they're read the book. I don't want to read the book. Then go live your life the way you want to live it and see how it works out. It doesn't work out. It never has worked out that way. Because Jesus came and turned the world upside down. You want to find your life, you lose it. You hold on to it, you, you, you lose it. Now, here's what's crazy. If you, if you figure out a way to, to manage this, you're going to be persecuted by your own people. Because if you say Jesus is the answer, they're going to say, no, he's not. This is the answer. Enough is enough. We've waited 400 years. We're going to torch the place. We're taking over. F the police. F the police. Oh, that's brilliant. Don't ever call 911 again. Oh, I got verses for F the police. Romans 13, you're going to hate this. And remember, this is written, Paul, two Christians in Rome, under horrific circumstances. The worst ends up being Nero himself, who is one of the most evil things that ever was born. Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. You say, I don't like who he picked. He didn't ask you. And thank God you don't live someplace where it's a king if you don't like who was in charge. Because then you've got to figure out how to kill him or pray he dies. At least we live in a, in a republic where we, we elect them and they can't stay longer. You say, well, I don't like this president. There's plenty of presidents you're not going to like. They're just people. But you don't, have any, you don't have an option here. No authority except from God. The authorities exist or appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Has this guy lost his mind? Where does he live? Like in a county outside of some peaceful place and thinks this is appropriate? How can you even write this stuff given where he lived? These are people who got Jesus. They, they nailed him to a cross. That's how vile these people are. But what does he say? Rulers are not a terror to do good works, but to, eat, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. He is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger to, ex to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, what can happen, but also for conscience sake. 
And then it gets even more ridiculous. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom, to whom honor. And you say, dude, you're nuts. I'm not doing that. There's bad cops out there. There's bad preachers out there. There's bad people everywhere. But F the cops, F the police, you want anarchy, you want bedlam? Let's, let's just have a national day of F the, F the cops and have them all stay home. Do you know what would happen on that day? Every organized crime, every, every criminal in the world would plan for that day and they would come to your house and to your business and they would destroy the place because F the cops. You can't have a civilized society. You say, well, I don't like the people that are in charge. Then, then be a godly person and pray. See, we say, well, but I prayed and nothing happened. Oh, oh, I see. We're, we're not going to wait on God anymore because we're just going to take it into our own hands. That's brilliant. Like God can't do it. Oh, I wish I didn't have more, but I got just a couple more. <laughs> First Timothy chapter two. Verse one. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, everybody. And then he goes, starts the top of the list for kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Now, some of you have been, li been alive long enough. Let's just take presidents. I hate to tell you, I don't care if you like them or not. You better be praying for them. I have prayed for presidents I wasn't crazy about. You know why I pray for them? That's what my book says. And that's what I'm going to have to answer for. The Bible, Old Testament especially, is replete with God himself changing the heart of a wicked, evil king. Well, I don't want to change. I just, I just pray he would die or be removed from office. Oh, now we know how much lives matter. See, we say there's all this hate in the world. I'd get you your own hate detector and hook it up. I don't care what color you are because we got a lot of animosity going. Kings, all who are in authority, that we may, why? Why would you pray for them? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that's the bottom line. People say, well, I want social justice. There will never be any social justice unless Jesus is, is, is operating in the middle of it. No justice, no peace. I agree with that. If I got justice, I'd, I'd end up in hell. The only reason I got peace, someone got strung up for me. The reason I have peace is there was justice. It wasn't my kind of justice. It was his kind of justice. You're guilty. You sinned. You deserve death. You deserve hell. But I will take your place. And now I'm going to live forever, not because I'm better than anybody else, but because he picked, he decided he loved me. I don't understand that. But it looks to me like he ain't just picking white people. He's picking all kinds of people. Whosoever calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. I still go back to this, and I don't. Have, I, I'm telling you, I don't understand except for God himself. 
some of the greatest music ever produced are Negro spirituals written by slaves who were born with no hope of freedom, and a lot of them died with no hope of freedom. But somehow they sing about joy and peace and love and stuff. You can't, there's no way. Curse God and die. Once you figure out what happened to you and what's going to happen to you, suffering, persecution, you'll never be free. There's some kind of freedoms that even chains can't stop. If the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. Now, if we all believe that and we take that back into our culture, people may think we're nuts, but they'll realize we're family. And I extend an invitation to people watching out there. You say, well, my church, you know what? Do something. And swapping choirs with a black church ain't the answer. Have relationship with people. How hard can this be? And how obvious it is that we don't have any interest in it. And black churches need to do the same. Well, I'm not going to invite a white person down to my black church. Why not? Well, they don't, they don't want those white people down there. Why not? Well, they can't sing. <laughs> they clapping on the offbeat. It's all messed up. couple more. James 1, 19. This is pretty simple. So then, my beloved brethren, written to Christians, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You want to wave a white flag? I'll tell you who to wave it for. Wave it at him. I quit. I surrender. I'm not going to fight you anymore. The world says this is the answer, this is what I'm supposed to do, and you say just the opposite. But I'm your kid, or I want to be your kid, and this is what it says to do. I yield. I surrender. We sing about this. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. All means all. Your feelings, your positions, your agendas, your tweets. God gets blamed on so much crap. Oh, I just felt the Lord prompting me to do this. Well, I don't know. I don't know it must have been a little L, Lord, somewhere. Um, I got no other answer for you. It's Jesus. And there's people that'll tell you it's a bunch of other stuff. It's not anything else but Jesus. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for loving us, for being so patient with us. We are crazy children. And we get emotional and we stomp and we scream and we try to do everything but what you say to do. And we raise our kids teaching them crazy things. You can't trust white people. You can't trust black people. You, you, they're all criminals. All, this, all these lies, Lord, to, draw, to keep us apart. And yet you said that by this will all men know that you are my disciples. You have loved one for, for another. We claim to love you, Lord, and you love us, and we love our neighbors ourselves. Just we're too selective on who the neighbors are, and it's too revealing. Um, Holy Spirit, do your work. Um, help us surrender.
and allow you to not just live in us, but through us and take us where you want us to go, say what you want us to say, be who you want us to be, be yourself, not what would Jesus do, what did Jesus do? And he laid down his life, suffered and died at the hands of evil men, sinful men, and died even for those people who put him up on that cross. So Lord, for anybody out there who's like, I, I, gotta, I got no hope, I'm angry, I need answers, and I see now that Jesus is the answer. I don't understand all his tactics. It seems like it doesn't work, but it's, it's what he says. I'm going to, by faith, apply his tactics to my life in this world. And they would reach out, as it were, the hands of their heart and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. My heart is deceitful above all things desperately wicked who can know it and it's my sin that got you killed um, it was my knee on your neck that day and so I don't deserve anything the mercy that I get but I accept it freely as a gift and as grace and I thank you that you love me that Jesus died on the cross was buried and raised from the dead to offer me eternal life, abundant life, and to be salt and light in a world that is bland and dark and desperately needs us to step up and get out of the way and let you be you in and through us. And Father, we've talked about a lot today, and uh, what a mess sin creates. And we get so far from you. Just little by little, we get, get so diluted, we don't even know what it was in the first place. Help us get back to truth, things that are, that, that are true. It's just basic stuff. And to sift through the things in our own lives, Lord, that are just beyond inappropriate, their sin. And break our hearts, change our hearts. Help us care about people the way you do, regardless. You're the best. Sure, I'm glad this is over. Help us be better kids, your kids, where it looks like we're really in your family together. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, for uh, anybody at home, um, I know this is very intense, but somebody maybe at home or wherever you are or here, you may have made the biggest decision you ever make in your life. Um, and that's whether you're going to trust Jesus or not, whether you're going to trust God with your life or not, whether you're going to let him decide where you can end up or not, and not what the world says. And uh, if you made a decision to trust him, then I encourage you to just send us an email, just send it to reunion at reunionchurch.org and tell us um, what happened and what you're thinking. And uh, let us, we want to be an encouragement to you, whether you're out there or here, anywhere you are, as we can. Um, so, nobody like Jesus. Um, in here, what we normally do, uh, we take an offering so you can join us. Uh, it's extraordinary how many people watching and listening have participated and uh, are giving to support, keep it going. So we appreciate that so much. Um, you can go to reunionchurch.org and there's a contribute give tab. You can click on that and plenty of ways you can see there. You can do it online or send a check, whatever you feel led to do. And for those of you here, we'll have some boxes here you can give or if you want to do it online as well you can do that um, so I've tried to say this through the years uh, Tony I'm very proud of you very proud of you and what you don't know about Tony is she takes all of that <laughs> Tony and goes back into some tough areas and teaches some kids 
And I promise you, she's telling them what they can do and what they can be, not what they can't. Right? So, um, I love you guys. And I, it, is, it is the joy of my life <laughs> that he gave me a shot at doing something like this together. Because this isn't hard. This is impossible without him. It's impossible. So, let's stand up and let's sing our way out of here. Uh, God bless you, love you, and hopefully see you here soon in person.